Like um, Sister Christina said, I think I don't really know what to say, short of words. That was really, really good. That was really, really wonderful. You know, that's part of the culture, I mean, we cherish so much. You know, because it's like a people without culture are like a lost people. You know, so we're very grateful, I mean, that we have people in our midst, you know, who bring this culture, who still showcase this culture, you know, for us, even in this society, and even for our host country, I mean, to see, I mean, that, you know, the African culture, I mean, is very diverse, you know, but it's still an enjoyable one. Thank you so much, Brother Raymond. Thank you, my young sister. The performance was wonderful. The next speaker is a young lady a student, an advocate and secretary, a secretary I mean, that works in the office of a lawyer. She's also the youth representative of the CCD. She'll be coming to talk to us about the challenges faced by youth and their parents in relation to social and cultural integration in the Norwegian society. So, on that note, I would like, I mean, it's, I mean I'm, I'm very delighted, especially when it's coming from a youth, I would like um, for my sister, Jeanette Mungai, to come forward and tell us what's the best way to cope with these challenges that some of us believe we face in the West. Thank you very much. Please. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Janet Mungai. I'm the daughter of this lovely woman sitting there who was just on stage. Uh, I am her youngest daughter uh, out of six children. Yeah. Since we're talking about integration and everything, that it's important to actually talk Norwegian, you know? Yeah. So, okay, my, yeah, like I said, my name is Janet. Um, I'm a 32 year old woman, mother of two. I come to Norge when I was two years old. Yeah. Jeg visste ikke helt hvor jeg var, når jeg kom, hvem jeg var, hvem noen var. Altså, jeg var et lite barn. Men å vokse opp i dette landet, så har jeg opplevd ting som mange av dere ikke har opplevd. For eksempel integrering. Det var ikke noe som jeg måtte lære meg. Det var ikke noe som jeg måtte gå på kurs for. Det var ikke noe som jeg måtte få opplæring i. Det bare skjedde av seg selv. Jeg gikk i barnehage, gikk på skole. Det bare skjedde. Men for min mor, min far og de som var eldre enn meg, det var annerledes. Fordi det var en helt ny Kulturforskjell. Egentlig, det er ikke bare kulturforskjell, men jeg tror det er også litt sånn kultursjokk, faktisk. 
som bara sker plötsligt när man kommer till Norge eh, 1980 sent på 80-talet så var inte Norge vant med invandrare. Den första invandringsstormen som kom i Norge var ju eh, från från Asien. Det var inte afrikanere. De kom väldigt många år efter. Så för mina föräldrar att komma hit och ha små barn och ska lära dem något som de själva inte vet egentligen vad ska de lära dem? Vad ska de Vad ska de lära dem? De 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 själva har ju problem med att förstå hur den ska vi integrera oss i det här samhället. Så det är er ma- massa ting så som när jag är lika gammal eller ja runt den tiden min mor var när hon kom till Norge och jag förstår ju mycket mer än det hon förstod den tiden. Och en ting som jag faktiskt inte förstår är er hur den man går på alla de så här eh, intervjuerna och du söker om upphåll och statsborgarskap och allt det där och du ska följa upp du ska göra det du ska göra det men vem är er det som egentligen ska hjälpa alla dessa här människorna till att faktiskt förstå alltså hur går det egentligen visst är han 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 snackat om eh, hur man ska uppdra barn. Du kan inte lära en en gammal hund nya tricks, ikvant. Så det vill säga si, det du är er vant med. Det är er det du är er vant med. Och hvis du då eh inte kan plus du kommer till ett nytt land, annorlunda kultur, nytt samhälle, andra regler. Hur ska du du vet hur du ska disciplinera dina barn? Men det är er ju lov i Norge som han sa och vara fysisk mot dem. Jag säger inte att man ska vara fysisk, men det är er det man vet från för av. Så hur ska man gå för att lära hur han ska göra det här? Jag har en 13, 14, 15-åring jente. Hon svarar tillbaka till mig, vad ska jag göra? Det är er ju ingen hjälp att få. För det man är er van till det man har blivit upplär till. Så och vuxa upp i Norge. Ja, det är er, er fint, det är er bra, det är er, jag klagar inte, men det är er många utmaningar som 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 kommer för att jag som ett människa har en uppfattning som inte Mina föräldrar tänker på samma måte. Och så blir det en väldigt stor crash. Oss emellan. Vis jag kunde ha sagt det här för eh, ja, 10-15 år sedan så hade jag uppfordrat alla där här som har barn eller som kommer till att få barn eller som inte har barn uansett. Och som han också sa, det är er inte inte nödvändigtvis dina barn, men kanske din syster eller din bror sina barn. Man må följa upp för det är er väldigt 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 fort gjort att gå du är er på en rätt linje. Du kan plötsligt falla på utsidan. Och när du faller på utsidan, vad gör du då? Vad gör man då? När barnet ditt säger att de ska gå på skolan, de går inte på skolan. De går till Oslo City. De går på Oslo S. De hänger på städer. Vad gör man då? Du vet inte det. Och så kommer det föräldramöte och så säger de, ja du vet ditt barn har ett väldigt mycket fravär. Och så säger man, hä? Men jag sänder dem var dag till skolan. Nej, den har inte varit på skolan. Och där får man problem. 
Och det vill inte säga si att du har gjort något fel, men du tänker när du sender barnet dit av gårde, du tror den ska gå på skolan. Och då hade gått till ett helt ant, alltså det har gått för långt. När ditt barn säger, mamma, I'm going to school. Okej, okay. här är matpacke. See you. Och så går de ett halvt, då har det gått för långt. Där må folk som är runt passa på och sörja för att det här inte kommer att ske. För det kommer att utveckla sig till att bli ett väldigt, väldigt stort problem. Dropp ut av vidaregående. Och vad sker när man droppar ut av vidaregående? Vem ska ansätta en person? Och det, det som är vanskligt är nå är att föräldrar är nöjda till att följa med väldigt, 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 väldigt. Alltså, jag har en datter som är snart tio år. Hon har sånt spel och sånne ting på iPad och allt det där. Och hon säger ting. Mamma, det är sån och sån. Så säger vad betyder det? Ach, mamma, du är så gammal. <laughs> Okej. Okay. Men jag må, jag må liksom, jag, jag må följa med. För det, det, det sker, det sker väldigt mycket. Och de här barnen växer väldigt fort. Och föräldrar må bara nöjt till att följa med och vara där. Om du inte får stå, inte få tala om att du inte får stå, bara låt som. För alla så ser du, du är du är gammal. Bara låt som. Och så kan du gå när de sover, gå på Google och skriv vad betyder det och det. Och så ja, gör det. Men men inte vis dem för det där blir det såna ah hon är hon är så gammal hon är så skädlig. Jag har bara någon sån här små notatarker här. Så förberett är jag. Um, det här är bara sån här alltså fakta när när jag snackar om integrering i Norge i vart fall. Um, det startar med att Norge är ett icke homogent samfund. Okej? Okay? Homogent. Det vill säga si att alla är lika. Norge är inte det. För att där där alla är olika människor. Ja, olika kulturer, olika människor. Eh, i Oslo är det inte så illa som vi du hade bott i en liten bygd mitt i Norge. Då är vi säkert. Att... Okej, okay, kan jag ställa ett spörsmål? Vem i detta rum har upplevt rasism i sitt liv i Norge? Upp med honom. Mamma, upp med honom. Ja. Okej, 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 okej. Ja. Vi vi alla har vi alla har upplevt det. Vi har det. Och men det är inte alltid att de som eh, visar oss att de faktiskt menar det med med ett ont hjärte, det är faktiskt det kan hända det är främmande frykt. Att de vet faktiskt inte bättre. De är inte vant till det. De syns det är rart. Eh, vi ser annorlunda ut, vi luktar annorlunda. Maten vår luktar väldigt, hela gången luktar för det att vi har lagat mat. Alltså alla dessa tingena och vi klär oss annorlunda, vi pratar högt och ja. Så det, det här är bara som ting. Oh baby. Det går fint. De är baby. Vi var alla baby en dag. Så eh det som faktiskt är man bara se si, när det gäller integrering i Norge där fann jag ut igår faktiskt att samma där vet samma samma folket visste det att samma loven blev vetat i 1987 Det det är 30 år sedan Alltså tänk samene blev godkänt som 
norske befolkning i 1987. Så hvordan i all verden skal de godkjenne oss når de ikke godkjente samene for 30 år siden? Altså, det gir jo ikke med. Men det er en lang vei, det er en veldig lang vei å gå. Men jeg tror sånne ting som det her, sånn her seminar og at afrikanere går sammen, spiller ingen rolle hvor du er fra vest eller øst eller sør eller nord, spiller ingen rolle. Sør er jo bare Sør-Afrika, men ok. Men Afrika, Asia, spiller ingen rolle. Vi alle er mennesker. Thank you, sister. Vi alle er mennesker. Vi alle er... Vi har en bakgrunn alle sammen. Alle kom hit for forskjellige grunner. Og jeg tror alle vil bare gjøre det beste med å være her. Ikke sant? Og som man sier, when you go to the Romes, you do what the Romes do. Ikke sant? Så når man kommer til Norge, da skal man snakke. Thank you. Lær de der reglene, og feire 17. mai, og gjøre de der. Dere må ikke spise grøt hver lørdag. Eller sånn her, hva heter det? Lute fisk? Nei, det er ikke det som er nødvendig, men bare være en del av samfunnet. Og når dere viser deres barn at dere gjør det, da blir de også motivert til å bli norsk. Ja, og at ikke de skal bare være med sin gruppe med folk. Og det er fint, altså det er veldig fint å være, men bare integrere. Og en ting som er nå, som jeg tror er et litt problem nå med dagens samfunn, det er internett. Ja, jeg tror internett er et større problem enn det man faktisk snakker om. Internett har positive ting. Ja, du får masse informasjon fra internett. Du kan snakke med folk, se på dem, facetime. De er i Afrika, Asia, Amerika, Australia eller på morgenen, og du kan facetime med dem. Men barn blir veldig påvirket av ting. Veldig fort. Barn er som en svamp. Du tar en svamp, du putter den i vann, den suger til seg vann. Og det er det som skjer når barna er på internett. Så for alle som har små barn under 15-16 år, må man passe veldig, veldig, veldig godt på. Hva er det barnet ditt egentlig gjør på den iPaden? Hva gjør den på telefonen? For det finnes... Den verden der ute, den er ganske skummel, altså. Den er det. Til og med til oss voksne mennesker. Den er ganske skummel. Når jeg vokste opp, så trengte ikke mine foreldre å passe på... Og hva gjør Janet på telefon? Jeg hadde ikke... Jeg hadde en Nokia... Ja, når jeg gikk på ungdomsskolen. Men nå har små barn som går i andre klasse en smarttelefon med internett med tilgang til veldig mye og det finnes grenser aldersgrenser Snapchat, internett nei, Snapchat, Instagram Facebook, Twitter det finnes en grense og det er en grunn til at det er en grense på det fordi det er masse der ute og den som sitter på andre siden av telefonen og chatter med ditt barn, du vet ikke om den personen er faktisk... Du vet ikke. Du vet ikke om det er en gammel mann. Du vet ikke. Så, siden jeg snakker for ungdommer fordi jeg har vokst opp i Norge, jeg tror dere har mer problem nå enn det var for 
ti år siden. Fordi nå er det... De er smarte, disse barna. De er veldig smarte. De er smartere nå enn det vi var for ti år siden. De kan masse ting. Og de, de tar ting veldig... Ja, så jeg blir sånn... Ja, som sagt, min datter sier jeg er gammel, så jeg er gammel. Så hvis jeg er gammel, så vet jeg ikke hva andre er. <laughs> Men jeg tenker det beste er å, å, å følge opp veldig... Gå, gå på de her foreldremøtene. Om ikke du kan, la mannen din gå. En eller annen representere. Vær involvert i om det er barnehage, eller barneskole, eller ungdomsskole, eller videregående, eller universitetet. Fordi barn er jo, deres barn er jo deres barn helt til, you know, forever. Så dere blir jo ikke, det er ikke sånn at, åh, i dag har du blitt 18 år, da er ikke jeg mamma lenger. Det er jo ikke sånn det fungerer. Dere, de er jo deres barn helt til, You know, det skal gå på andre siden. Hver, og, kanskje ikke alltid barna har lyst at du skal være involvert så mye i livet. De synes det er flaut. Mamma, du kan ikke skisse meg på skolen. Folk ser på meg. Hva? Hva mener du? Folk ser på deg. Altså, nei, du kan ikke, nei, du må ikke hente meg fra skolen, nei, du kan ikke levere meg, jeg er stor, altså, ikke, ikke klem meg, altså, det er sånn, hva er det du mener? Så, han har tatt tre skritt bak, og bare være der, selv om de ikke forteller dem noen ting, men bare være der, ikke at dere skal gå inn i privatlivet til barna, ikke gjør det, for da blir det et veldig stort problem. Fordi da har du skuffet meg. Og vi alle vet at tenåringer kan være dramatiske. Så, men å være involvert og, og følge opp. Og det, det tar, det krever veldig mye tid, det krever veldig mye energi. Fordi at ting går så fort. Ting går veldig fort nå, i hvert fall med denne her... I denne verden vi lever i, det går veldig fort. Teknologi bare... Du, 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 du. Så du må vite hva Snapchat er. Du må vite hva Facebook er. Du må, du må bare være involvert. Og så må du, uansett hva det er, så synes jeg det er veldig viktig. Om barn er født i Norge eller ikke født i Norge, det spiller ingen rolle. Ok. Jeg synes det er veldig viktig at man eh, viser dem den kulturelle bakgrunnen som de har. Hvor enn folk er fra, hvor i Afrika eller Asia eller hvor, hvor enn det er. Men at man lærer også barnet, så at de ikke plutselig er 17-18 år og bare, oi! Jeg visste ikke at jeg var fra Afrika. Jeg er jo født i Norge. Så da blir det et annet problem. Men man må ha en balanse. Du, du, du bor i Norge. Du må også ta vare på din kultur. Delta. Ikke bare tenk at afrikanere er sånn her... Som de kan bli fremstilt noen ganger. De er alle kriminelle og de bråker og... Ja. Det er det de blir fremstilt. Det står alltid det i avisen. Hvis en afrikaner har gjort et land, så står det alltid i avisen med afrikansk bakgrunn. Det står alltid det. Og da tenker jeg, hva mener du afrikansk bakgrunn? Hvorfor kan ikke du si hvilket land det er? Hvor, hvorfor i det hele tatt sier du det? Hold det til den saken, så at barna får vite at de er fra det landet de er fra, og de kan være stolte over det, men også integrere seg i det norske samfunnet og sette pris på begge to. Altså, man er heldig. Jeg føler meg veldig, veldig heldig. Jeg skal avslutte nå, mister. Jeg skal avslutte nå. Jeg føler meg veldig heldig som har 
bodde i Norge i så många år och att jag fortsatt har min kenianske bakgrund håll det på sig. Att jag kan gå tillbaka till Kenya. Jag reser dit och jag snackar swahili och ja. Jag känner mig väldigt heldig och det är er viktigt att ha en balans att man inte ska bara fokusera på ett ställe för det kommer en tid där alla ungdomar blir vuxna. Och där är er det väldigt synd hvis de växer upp och har trott en ting och så växer de upp till att bara va? Det här sa ju du till mig. Du lärde dig mig det här. Du vet? Ja. Så eh, jag skulle bara säga si det och så ska jag säga si tack för mig. Tusen uh, hjärtligt tack. Thank you very much um, for that very very encouraging and uh, educative summation of what it entails to be an African living in a different society or living in Norway. You know, and she ended her speech by saying, you know, we should be actively involved. We should participate in the lives of our children, not intruding in their privacy, but in participating in what they do. And we should encourage, motivate them to be part of both cultures rather than wait until when they are grown-ups, allowing them to awaken to a different reality. And she also spoke about the importance of why it's necessary for us to care for one another's children, for us to care for one another. It's very important. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the next session will be a panel session. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sister Janet. Thank you for a wonderful speech. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for that presentation. It was extraordinary. So I would like to call on Sister Ben Tadiambo. I would like to call on Brother Wasin Tashome, um, Brother Churchill Odiero, um, Professor Ingeli Selien. Um, and to please come on stage, please. And... Um, before we go to the panel section, um, it is a privilege, I mean, to acknowledge the presence of um, one of the people who have really been fighting our causes. You know, most of us living here, I mean, I think we know this brother, you know, but um, it's a privilege to acknowledge his presence. I would like to acknowledge the presence of um, Aki, we all call him Aki, Akhenaton de Leon, um, who is the leader of Omud. OMUT stands for Organization Moods Often Led Discriminating. Yeah, so that's what it stands for. So please, um, before we start that, I mean, I'll give you an audience for five minutes, I mean, to tell us some, or to give us some facts about integration in Norway. Um, please, sir. Please, 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 let's, let's welcome him. Tack för invitationen. Som man sa, jag heter Akhenaten de Leon och har arbetat i förhåll till integreringsfrågor i 25 år i år. Och det är er många år. Och undervis så har jag lärt en god del ting. Vi har fått en god del erfaring genom klienter som kommer till oss. Vi har ett kontor i Storgata Tiva. Vi hjälper folk med juridisk, juridisk rådgivning vägledning i förhåll till hur man tar kontakt med offentliga institutioner. Man kan ha någon typ av problem och så kommer de till oss och så kan vi hjälpa. Um, jag har lyst bara ta två ting när det gäller integrering. För det är nog vi snackar om i Norge varje eneste dag. Snackar om integrering i avisen, integrering uh, i stortinga, politiska partier och så vidare och så vidare. För mig är det två ting som jag ser på nu. Det ena är er arbete. Glöm oss utlänningar. Ha våra barn som har fött och uppvuxit i Norge. Norsk utbildning, norsk bakgrund, har de samma möjligheter som Ola och Kari. 
Så ha Fatima fra Furuset samme muligheter i arbeidsmarkedet. Og det kom forskning for noen år tilbake, bare fire-fem år tilbake, Fafo-rapport. Hvor, og forresten, Fafo vil ikke gjøre denne forskning. Vi måtte pushe dem. Vi måtte være en pådriver. Fordi jeg sa til Fafo at det er ingen som kommer til å si at de ansetter ikke deg fordi du er afrikaner. Det er ingen som sier det. Det er ingen som kommer til å si at jeg ansetter deg ikke fordi jeg liker ikke deg. Det er ingen som sier det. Det vil være mange andre variabler. Men det er nordmenn som får jobben, stort sett. Og det som vi sa var at send ut fiktive søknader med samme type utdanning, samme bakgrunn, norsk utdanning, men bare forskjellige navner. Og de gjorde det. De sendte ut 1500, hvis jeg husker riktig, søknader. En tredjedel av de som hadde fremmet klingende navner ble ikke innkalt til intervju. Mellom 25 prosent og 30 prosent med fremmet klingende navne ble ikke innkalt til intervju. Det er første gang at forskerne, og da sier jeg at det er utrolig, fordi vi må nok så ofte vente på den hvite mannen for å fortelle deg at du blir diskriminert. Og da er det legitimt. Så vi måtte vente på Fafo i 25 år for at de skal fortelle oss at vi er diskriminert. Men det visste vi hele tiden. Så det er et problem. Arbeidsmarkere, adgang til arbeidsmarkere, det er noe som vi må se på når det gjelder våre barn. De har ikke like muligheter. Det er den ene. Den andre jeg har lyst til å ta opp, det er hvordan fremstiller Norge det norske samfunnet fortsatt i dagens samfunn. Og der har jeg et lite eksempel. Og det var Oslo kommune i 2012, og 2013, Oslo kommune. De tok ut et stort reklame på langfredag. Påskehilsning. 2012-2013. Det var påskehilsning, en hel side, midt side. God påske, Oslo. Og der var det alle sammen. Blende hvit. Rengjøringsassistenten var hvit. Taxisjåføren var hvit, sykepleieren var hvit, alle var hvite. Og det var en god påstningshelse til Oslo kommuner i 2012 og 2013. Og da har det skjedd noe. Det er et gap mellom praksis og lære. Fordi vi hører hele tiden om integrering, inklusjon. Men når det offentlige Norge tegner et bilde av Norge, den er blendet hvit, så her har vi problemer. Og for det så er det oss, vi som deltar, som forrige taleren sa, vi må engasjere samfunnet. Vi må informere samfunnet. Og la meg bare fortelle deg, det er ikke på grunn av rasisme i Oslo kommune at de gjorde det. Det er mer komplisert enn det. Hvis det var kun rasisme, det er greit. Men det er ikke det. Vi gikk inn til de som drev med kommunikasjon. Og da sa de, herregud, hvordan kan vi gjøre noe sånt så dumt? Men når vi ba dem se på reklamebyrået som de tok kontakt med, for å si at vi vil ha mangfold i bildet. Men hva betyr mangfold for reklamebyrået? Og det eneste mangfoldsbildet du finner hos reklamebyrået, vet du hva det er for noe? Takk skal du ha. Takk skal du ha. Thank you very much. I mean, I think that's a very good introduction into the panel discussion that we'll be having very soon. And um, I think I'll probably also want um, Brother Aki, I mean, to be on the panel <laughs> so that, I mean, he will also be able to answer some of the questions, I mean, that we have for the speakers. Thank you very much, Brother Aki. I must say that uh, we are privileged to have uh, Aki with us. Akin has been uh, supporting us mostly in every s seminar that we have been having. Oh. Okay, Akin is uh, one of our mentor, a role model. And uh, what I might say to comment, which is very, very important, is that uh, if I may say Pan-Africanism started from Caribbean, where he comes from, 
uh, and then later it was pushed to Africa because they said no, Africa is the one who deserves this. So Akil has been following Pan-Africanism up to here to us and we are privileged to have him as a true son of Pan-Africanism. Uh, I'm going to give him the flowers before the, the, panel. the panel and if it, it will depend <laughs> it will depend on how much he's going to do on the panel. You people, you are the one who are, who are going to acknowledge. If he doesn't do well with the panel, I'm sorry, who will get these flowers. I will have to check and wait on his flowers. <laughs> Thank you very much, Auntie Christina. Um, please, Brother Tewasan, please come on stage. Um, Brother Churchill, uh, please come on stage. Um, Professor Ingelise, uh, please come on stage. Um, please, if you have a question or if you have a comment, uh, you can do that by lifting up your hands, and I will come with the microphone to you. And please, um, because of time, uh, make it very short, please. Please. And like I said earlier, um, we'll be grateful if you can indicate who of the panelists you are directing your questions to. So the floor is open, please. Yes, um, please, Sister Janet. Sorry, please. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. And um, I don't really have any questions, but I just really need to say thank you for today. But I want to comment on Ingelisa. Ingelisa, yeah. I really like the perspective you had when you were presenting the, your research. And I feel the, what I feel is very uh, unique in your presentation is that instead of criticizing that these people don't want to change, but you research deeper to really present it in a respectable way, the force that is behind the FGM. But I really thank you because most of the people go and say they are there's something wrong with them, they don't think. But I think you research, your understanding is deeper than that. And I really encourage you to go out and help different people to really buy your way of, um, yeah, the way you present it. So I really honored and then feel like uh, you have respect for the people, even though they're practicing things that is not encouraging, it's not good. But at the same time, the, we have to meet everybody with respect and to really make a change we have to love them so thank you yeah. uh, thank you very much that was exemplary this is to Ingelisa my question is during your um, interviews with these ladies who have been circumcised most of them, the aim of being the circumcision is for them to towards their wedding or something. Was it? Yeah. Does it mean that all the ladies during your investigation or your research, they were forced to marry or they were not, some of them could easily not get married? Don't they have single ladies living there? What happens to them if they decide not to marry? Um, thank you very much. Um, I think I'll try to um, explain the question properly to the professor. Um, she's asked, I mean, that you, during your lecture, you mentioned something about these ladies are prepared for marriages. So our question now is, I mean, if that's the case, I mean, does it mean, I mean, these societies are free from single ladies? You know, but we'll take other questions, you know, before, you know, so just digest the question and, and prepare your answer. Yeah, thank you very much. It's the English again. <laughs> thank you very much for your presentation, English. And I liked it very much because last, last year when I attended this meeting, Two people presented about the FGM. Uh, according to their presentation, they could, uh, in one way, confirm that uh, FGM will never change because it is cultural, 
in deeply cultural, which will never change. But why I, I like your presentations because you could even tell us that there's some percentage of changes. Have you read the, the book by Professor Hans Rosling about which is factfulness? Yeah, the, the professor explained that whatever changes will happen just 0.1 percent this year, for example, and next year again 0.1 percent, and then another year 0.1 percent, then it will be 0.3 percent. Yeah, so it's very nice that you could even tell us and show us that there's some changes. It means that what you have been doing, it, it hasn't been a wastage. So my, uh, I, I would think that maybe you have to change the strategies, the intervention with, where you have been using to combat that problem. And I, I hope we will we, 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 um, manage to eradicate that. I have another to that man. Uh, to You had nice presentation. You, show, you, you told us, you could show us how the government is giving money, funds to, for the integration, the employment, education among immigrants. But in practice, it doesn't work. You are focusing on newcomers. What about those who have been here struggling to get a job, but they are not? And another thing, when you see drop out in the high education institutions, among immigrant students, the drop out is very high. Have you thought about that? Yes, I will come back. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Um, the, the last question, I mean, that was um, directed to Brother Tashome. I mean, I think um, I would just like to. Um, tell the audience what he said at the beginning of this of his lecture. He is just a normal bureaucrat. He is not a politician. He is just there to implement the policies that have been decided by politicians. But you'll get a chance, I mean, to answer the question. Uh, I have no question for the panel. I'm just contributing a little bit. From our bureaucrat, I like what you said. Uh, I have to commend power very much for this year because I will be saying every year you guys are talking about about uh, this FMG FMG. This year, you guys, you guys have done a very very good job for getting people outside to talk about uh, other things that FMG. But according to what our bureaucrat said, I mean he made a very good point. Next year, when you guys organize this seminar, please try to invite the policymakers. Because when we are talking about integration, it's a two-way system. It's not a one-way system. We can try to integrate as much as we can until we talk about it, we become blue on our faces. If the policies maker don't make room for the job givers to give people who want to integrate jobs, then we are standing still. You understand what I mean? The policy makers that will infect people who are job givers to provide jobs, for people that have, are ready to work. If they don't get jobs, then we cannot integrate. The best way of integrating people into the society is to give them jobs. When people keep educating, get one degree after the other, those who came with degrees, with PhD, they go and study and learn the language and they don't get jobs. So what do we have to say? So please, power, you are doing a good job. We invite our policy makers next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, I think I'll just like the panelists. I mean, to answer some of these questions, I would like Professor Ingelisa to start and answer the questions that we are directed to her, and I would like um, Brother Tashome to also answer his question, and I would like Aki, you know, because this question about you know, the absence of policy makers, you know, when we have occasions like this, I would also like you to address that question. Uh, thank you very much for your comment. Uh, I liked it a lot. Do you hear me? Yeah, I can hardly hear myself. <laughs> I want to say that those who circumcise their daughters, 
Uh, it's the family who circumcise their daughters and the, the children, they don't have informed consent. They don't con necessarily consent. So it is the parents, and they do it for the best of the children, of course. They do it for the future of the children, and they think about the fact that they are going to be married. So my marriage is a part of the decisions. It's in the mind of the parents that we have to make sure that our daughter get a good marriage so that she can have a happy life. And, that, and, and because of that, they, they circumcise her so that nobody should, shall say anything wrong about her. So they do it for, for very good reasons. Uh, so, uh, and that's in their mind. Uh, but of course there are unmarried women uh, and, and, and women or when they grow up, these girls, they, some of them can't marry and some of them go into polygamous marriages, become the third wife or the second wife or the first wife. So there are many uh, kind of adjustments here. And then the, the question about that, it, FGM will never change. It's a very good idea to look at this book uh, about factfulness. Yes, it's small changes, and that is the reason why some people are very impatient. They say, oh, so little have happened. But it is actually uh, declining. So it is changing, and we give it time. I'm absolutely sure it will change. I'm absolutely sure it will change, but it will take some time. And I have something that I want to add, but because it's my thinking to Aki. I think it is very important today, because of the refugee crisis that comes across Mediterranean with lots of Africans coming. There is this fear, and there is this fear about Africans. And the idea of, the, the, the concept of being an African has suddenly now, and it makes me very unhappy, because I love, I, I got to know all of these Africans which I really care for and love, and I can hear that the concept of being an African is becoming more and more negative. And we have to do something about it, because this is very, very, very bad. And there's so many, I mean, the Africans, I used to, I used to um, study the Pakistanis, and the Pakistanis, I s stayed in Pakistan for a couple of years, and the Pakistanis have a caste system. So once I wrote a book about racism, and some of the Pakistanis who came here felt that it was more racist in Pakistan than it was here. So they were happy to be here because then they got opportunities. But I think it's different now. And I think that the concept of being an African is something that we have to change. We have to lift it up. We have to show that it is a very good, that Africa is something else. We have to work with this concept. So we have to stop, because I think there has growing uh, discrimination in Norway now <laughs> against Africans. Yes, I think so. Yeah? Um, um, uh, I can just uh, comment what she just said, that the fact about racism and uh, it's a problem. Um, I think it has been a problem for many years and I think that, you know, home is where everything starts at home. So when we Africans can teach our children or our sisters or brothers or nephews or nieces or aunties that it doesn't matter if you're from Kenya, Somalia, Tanzania, Ghana, Nigeria, Sudan, it doesn't matter. We are all Africans. So when we all can just get together, you know, it's not supposed to be like the Somalians are there, the West Africans are there, East African is there. No, that, that's not how it's supposed to be. So when we Africans, that's why power is called Pan-African Women. It's not called Pan-African West African Women or East African Women. It's African Women. So when we all can just teach each other, it doesn't matter where you're from, as long as you're from Africa, 
just treat each other equally, like each other, and then the kids will grow up thinking that it doesn't matter where you're from. That's, that's my comment. Thank you. I just got a, a tough question. I wish I, I, wish I, I was not here. <laughs> no, it's okay. Uh, I, I, I don't know if, um, if um, I'll start with a question. And why do you focus only on newcomers? It's actually a question which uh, our politicians you know, get all the time. Because, as you said, it's, um, if you see the, budget, the national budget and so on, um, uh, most of it goes to uh, integration of uh, newcomers, and especially refugees. Um, I, I agree with you. I mean, you, you, you say that there is a big focus on the newcomers. But that is the policy of the country. Uh, m much, much of the money uh, goes to, to the integration of first comers, especially uh, integration of refugees. Uh, it has to do with, uh, because th there is a belief that people who come first to this country need to have a, 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 an organized integration process so that they should, be, they should be integrated from day one and then later on they should be they should manage themselves i mean if you see my presentation today uh, th that is the idea but at the same time there are uh, thousands of thousands of people who are not refugees or refugee background who come to norway and and are part of the society and who need to integrate um, unfortunately the the focus is less on the on those people uh, but at the same time uh, if I could answer about uh, giving jobs to integrate people, that's a whole, the whole integration policy is about it. It's, it says in order to integrate people, they need to have jobs. When they have jobs, they will earn money, they will be able to take care of themselves, their children, and they will pay taxes. And that way, this, the, 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 um, the welfare system to cont continues to be the way it is today. That's the whole integration policy, if you, re if you heard me say it. But at the same time, there is a, a, a what do I call it? I, I really struggle with the English. But uh, at, there are policies addressed to specific groups. The introduction program is focused on refugees and their families. And then after people have settled in the country, the main responsibility of securing jobs is NAVs. NAV is not under my department. Uh, my, um, uh, the department I'm working with has um, no responsibility for NAV. NAV is under the Ministry of um, Work and um, Labor, Labor and so, so, uh, Social uh, well, Social Welfare. Yeah. So, but that doesn't mean that the integration policy doesn't address those people. It addresses actually this year, this, this strategy I was just talking about, has a lot of focus on people, uh, people struggle, who, uh, on those who struggle to get jobs. And there are policies addressing, like, uh, addressing work um, employers, especially targeted towards employers, in order to give employers money so that they could hire people. And there is a focus on young people, recruiting young people to come into labor force and then bring them out of the unemployment uh, um, queues and, and put them into. There is, there is a policy. The problem is that the implementation, not everybody has the same, you know, you can implement it at the policy level, but implementing it at the local level, at the work, workplace level, could be a challenge. And, and I understand you very well. But as, as a bureaucrat, as he said, I cannot answer on, the, uh, on behalf of the NAV. That would be NAV should answer. And next time you should, uh, you should invite NAV to come here, sit and answer those questions. Because that's about, uh, they have the responsibility for that. Okay, I just want to cover some quick points here. Um, number one, they asked, where are the policy makers? To get policymakers, you have to do several things. It's called the carrot and the stick. You invite them to your seminar, they don't come, you embarrass them in the newspapers. That's one way of doing it. And I'm very serious. The other way of doing it is to create alliances with political parties, 
And so therefore you gain access to their politicians and then through the, the political party you invite them. But there's also, if Mohammed can't go to the mountain, the mountain must come to Mohammed. And therefore there is nothing stopping you from going to Stutinger. Pa Pawa, Parfin, they just send an application, say that we want to come with our delegation to Stutinger to meet the members. Again, if they say no, you have media. They don't want to meet these women coming from Africa, but they would love to speak about them and when it concerns policies, they would love to make policies about you, but not with you. These are the tactics and strategies that you have to use. That's number one. Number two, there was a question about why is there such a focus on knee and commander? Just arrives, just uh, new arrivals. That has always been the policy in Norway. The discussion has always been how many people we get over the border. Not how they have it after they have arrived, but how many people they get over the border. So they're counting the refugees. That has been the focus. And I would like you to consider another perspective. I'm not saying that's the case. I'm just saying to consider it. And I would like you to consider this perspective whenever the question comes up. It is big business. As long as you understand that refugees are big business and put it into perspective, then you will understand. I am saying that it takes five Norwegians employed to push one refugee around in the system. If they stop refugees from coming to Norway, employment will go up immediately. Can you imagine all of those who are working in UDI, who are working in IMDI, who are working at Utlendingspolitik, and within the structure, don't talk for NAV, there will be many people unemployed. So look at it from a business point of view and you'll understand. And by the way, I would like you to research who owns Flicknig's Mutak in Norway. Check that out. I, I just have one more point. Um, segregation. Somebody said something about the African community getting together. I would like to criticize the African community. You all are sitting down. You watch things happen to Africans and people of African descent and you do nothing. You know why? Because a Somalian woman was shot at Groenland. So the rest of Africa doesn't come. You don't see them at the demonstrations. I saw two Pakistanis at that demonstration, a couple West Africans. Other than that, leave the Somalians by themselves. When they killed Obiora, you didn't see any Somalians. You only saw West Africans, mainly Nigerians. So this is something that the African, Pan-African community has to look at. That when rain falls, you heard Bob Marley say that, that when rain falls, it don't fall on one man's house. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we'll be taking um, a few more questions, but before we do that, I mean, I would like to give the microphone um, to the chairperson um, of power. Sorry, it's not disrespectful, but there's a lady here. She has been a pioneer. I want to just, she's going, she has a problem somewhere. She has to live very fast. And she has been with us since the beginning for the all years we have been here. She's all the time supporting power behind the scenes. She's a very strong lady. Please just help me. Martha, please, Carolina, please come. A beautiful lady from Ghana, a pioneer just like us, who has been doing things behind the scenes. Please, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. In fact, just to run up my mission of coming here, today it's a, a International Children's Day at Intercultural Museum at Greenland. Today. And it started yesterday actually, so it's today and tomorrow. But the problem is, we are not together when it comes to practical things. Because um, I was called the last minute that they wanted an exhibition from all African countries. But we refuse to turn up. So how do we portray ourselves? So please, please, plan your time properly and then if you want to show the way Africans are, that is the way to put it for our children. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think the last speaker just addressed some of the questions I mean, that have been taken up today. Uh, the last shot about how do we organize ourselves. That should be a question for organizations like Power. That should be a question for organizations like OMUD. So, I mean, the ball is in your court. Please, 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 please lead us and tell us or show us how to do all that. Please, ladies and gentlemen, let's give him a warm hand of applause. Dr. John.
Thank you so much. I'll be very brief. And I want only to ask two questions. One will go to Aki and my brother from the ministry. But I'll exempt to you. But Aki, concerning Africans, everything we hear is just negative, negative about us. They say Africans are unemployed. Africans are like this. Africans are like this. Can somebody tell us what we have succeeded in? What has worked and what has not worked for us Africans? Because they are in Norway. For us Africans who are living in Norway. We are talking about Africans in Norway. They say, yeah. What has worked and not worked? Because they only hear negative. Everywhere you see, if you look, look at the statistics, Africans are unemployed. Africans are like this. Africans are like this. But honestly, we have successful Africans here in this society in different ways. Okay? I may not, one may not be in the paper, but being a good neighbor to your Norwegian friend, I mean to your neighbor, a Norwegian, is a success by itself also. Your children playing with your neighbor is a success also. So, can somebody tell us what our failures have been and what our successes are? My young, my son there, yours concerning sickle cell. I've been a lot in sickle cell. But can you tell the audience if there is stigma or related to sickle cell? What kind of stigma? Okay, as somebody with it or living with it in social interaction? Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, sir. Um, I think I'll give the microphone now to my sister. Yeah. Hi, I am Heather Naima, and I am the one who is here today. They have helped us with many things to show us why we are here today. I don't know how to integrate it, but I don't know how to integrate it. How do we know how to integrate it if we can speak Spanish? If we come to Norge, for example, Mange for elderna di kommer krikland. Så när de har kommit hit, de har inte fått hjälp. Bara de har fått nyckel och hus. Och så där säger de, kom där och integrera sig i norsk samfund. Vis norsk samfund säger till oss välkommen. Här är skola, här är information, här är sånt där vi kan integrera oss. Man vis bara vi kommer vi kan inte språk så barn vi sänder skola jag kan inte språk och så barn går på skola så efter på barn vis han gör nu en galt de kommer direkt till åtta så jag har inte fått information så hur dem vi kan integrera först vi måste lära språk så när vi lär språk vi kan diskutera med norska folk med integrering. De kommer och säger att vi är barnvane. Barnen dina har gjort idag någon fel i skolan. De har inte gjort det bra. Och så bara de tar. Så jag kan inte norsk. Jag kan inte norsk och jag har ingen vänner för sina mig. Afrikan eller någon som kan förstå min språk. Så bara gröter in i lägenheten. Och så där säger de kom ut och integrera sig. Först då. Först är jag må gå på skola, ge mig tid för att lära norsk. När jag lär norsk, efter att du kan diskutera med mig, efter många år. För det är inte... För det är inte lätt för att lära språk. Det är inte lätt för att finna jobb. Ja. Och så, ja, där säger där afrikaner att komma och integrera. Jag har problem. Jag och min är i Somalia i krig. Kroppen min är här. Barn har i skolan problem med barn och vanne. Och jag får mycket problem. Jag har bara mycket problem. Och så jag är tecknad idag. Jag kom ut och träffade med många fina människor. Och jag är glad. Och tack. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I think my sister has a very good point which have to be uh, looked at, but I'm um, of the opinion that uh, it's a comment actually, and then I have, I'll have to have a question uh, later on. Uh, she feels she needs help to integrate in society. Are you hearing me? Is it okay? Yeah. Uh, I believe in throwing the ball back to her. 
Because once you made a trip to come to Norway, I think the whole basic responsibility lies on you to do the basic effort to come in society. Because you've come in society that's established. I don't think society is going to rearrange yourself to meet your needs. You have to take the first step. Uh, okay, that's why I wanted to, 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 uh, to address Mr. Aki and uh, your neighbor that uh, you are fighting for the uh, for the integration of people, uh, integration. I believe the rights, right? The rights. I believe that if you are going to get any rights, you have to demand them. But you have to create what I call, I believe, is you be have to become a concurrent dictator, Albert Starke. That's you, an effort you have to make yourself. I don't think society is going to come and f give you that. It, that, so it doesn't give that to anybody here in Norway. Not Norwegians, ethnic Norwegians. They have to make, to take that first leap, then society will meet them halfway. I think that, not that message has to come down, trickle down to the people on the ground that don't come to know and expect to get things given to you. Once you've come to society, society is not, not going to rearrange itself. You have to fit yourself in society. That's one. Now I'm going to my sister, Janet. Uh, I have Ongdom Tenoring who I have to yeah I have uh, a Tenoring who, who I have to talk to to put onto the, onto the wall to understand the values and, 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 and uh, uh, the essence of getting herself together what a girl my concern, my, my, my pain is I don't really know how to communicate to her to, uh, to see the seriousness of what I'm saying. Because I have a totally different way, set up, of how, to, how I've been communicated to. But when I'm putting her onto the wall to put that into her brain, I'm reminded that who are noshk, who are noshk ungdom, I understand and appreciate that. But just past that, I see a hole she's going to fall in. If I roll back, I see she's going to fall into the hole. How, how do I get to communicate her to get that into her? I mean, putting my message to her and then preserving that, that perspective that she's who are not and not how do I, I mean, I'm asking you because you have both, you seem to have both sides of the, uh, the coin. Uh, first and foremost, I have to thank Power for a wonderful and successful uh, seminar. And I have to thank members of the panel sitting there for fantastic presentations. You've done your homework well, and uh, you've come out talking like experts in the various fields. And uh, generally, from my own point of view, I seem to understand that both of you are, or everybody there is talking about a common theme irrespective of the individual theme they took. It's all about integration at the end of the day. And uh, my question right now is that I think it's high time that we Africans stop blaming ourselves and take actions to demand for our own rights. And together I want to ask power this question and all members of the public there. How can we fight for affinitive action in Norway? Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Hello everyone, my name is Monica and I come from Uganda. My question or um, rather comment is on integration. I came to Norway four and a half years ago and I lived in the outskirts, I mean it's in a village in Sogn Fiorane. I was the only African in my village and integration was very difficult. And as soon as I approached the community with an idea to integrate people through events, they embraced the idea, but the problem was they did not know how to integrate the other foreigners. So as much as we are talking about integration in the city, we must also think about other Africans living outside the city. How can we work with the communities, other people out there? They are more than willing to integrate with us but they don't know how to do that yeah, thank you thank you for the comments
Thank you for power. Thank you for the speakers for the the presentations. I have a question for uh, Tishumi and Akim together. It's about uh, the new integration policy. Uh, don't you think that it's too late? Actually, it's from my uh, own experience uh, with the uh, introduction program. I think that it's not functioning. I mean, uh, how many how many refugees are coming now to Norway, so that you you, you want to improve the the introduction program so that the, the integration process will be easier. This is the first part. Uh, the second question is for Tishumi. Um, you are talking about 106 or 107 million crowns uh, that's given to the introduction process or introduction uh, integrating. Uh, the question is why still there are a lot of organizations that cannot get uh, fund or it's, why is it so difficult? I myself know at least five organizations that have been struggling for <laughs> six years and they got nothing up to now. The last question is for uh, Elisa. Uh, it's a very wonderful presentation, but uh, you said that um, she gained a lot of respect when 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 she practiced FGM. Actually, I don't I don't I don't agree with that. She she doesn't she doesn't get a lot of respect. She avoid disrespect, and then she gained a lot of disrespect to herself. If you if if you understand what I say. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we have just a couple of questions. Uh, my name is Rizeke. It's a <laughs> sorry. Uh, my name is Rizeke. I'm from Uganda. It's an honor to be here because actually it's my second time. My first time was last year, and uh, this is my second time. I had uh, two questions, but they have already been taken, so now I just have a remark. And uh, it's regarding when um, it has been mentioned about... Uh, how we ethnic minorities are not good at supporting it, each other. I rather feel, okay, it could be that, that we are not good at supporting each other, but then at the same time, I, as an ethnic minority who has been here for more than one decade, it is, um, I've heard of a Pan-African Women Association when I was still in my home country, but it is until last year that I actually got to know that it, there is an organization like that in Norway. So my question is that how open are you as an organization, not only Pan-African Women Association, but also other organizations to tell other people, other ethnic minorities about what you are doing, because I feel that uh, there is no openness. People are more quiet, those people who are making a difference, you are more quiet and you are not sharing information, you are not including others. So racism is among ourselves. Can we be better at that? Thank you. Racism in our midst is the last um, my name is Rose. My question will go to the young Jeanette, and I guess it goes together with Akiton. Yeah, uh, we have like I have two young peop young boys. I came with them to Norway, and like you, they've they are going through their ungdom. When they were children. They couldn't integrate because they said they couldn't Norwegian or they didn't have the dialect. Now that they are Norwegian in their own way in that environment, we come from Gruran, Dalen. So the problem is that age of 17, 18, 19 to 20 years, there is so much problem with those young people because they are not African and they are not Norwegian and that society there, we do not know how to deal with them. When they are together out there, maybe in McDonald's, the police come immediately and they are checking them and they are the ones being called criminals. The poor people, they are trying to understand what are they supposed to do. This has nothing to do, they've gone to school, 
they are still interested, they are doing things like Norwegian boys or girls do. But because they don't have the color, boys or people, my only question is this, what did we do wrong to be born black? Um, I won't be addressing the questions. I mean, I would like the panelists to address the questions. And as you please address the questions, please make it brief and, um, and end it with uh, a kind of closing remarks, please. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, I can start with the gentleman over there. Do you guys hear me? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, uh, you said you had a daughter. She's a teenager. And how do you put boundaries? It's, it's hard. She's a girl. She's going to make you crazy. Trust me. <laughs> I'm just telling you the truth. <laughs> but that, 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 it's hard. No, no, no. You should never give up. Because like, for, I'm a girl. And I made my dad go crazy when I was growing up. But for a girl, even though you, like, you, you feel like the dad is so annoying and he's so, ah, oh, but she's like, she look at you and you're her role model, you know? And they say later that when, when girl marry a man, it's kind of like their father, you know? The same, you understand what I mean? Like the same person had and the same things because a little girl always, that's why they say a daddy's girl, you know? But now you don't understand anything that she's going through because you are a man. So the only thing you need to do is don't ask too many questions and just, okay, okay. She's going to go through things that you don't even understand. I cannot, under I cannot explain this to you. You're a man. I cannot tell you this. So you will never understand. But just give her space. But don't let her just free like a bird, you know. Keep her close. And don't be too much in her space because she would be like, Oh, Papa, do I plug some? Just try to understand it's gonna be hard but trust me can you call me when she's like 21 22 that is when she will be normal <laughs> okay thank you and and, and then um, uh, the, the lady yeah okay I, ho I hope that will help you I, I hope you will sleep today uh, your two boys, um, you know, actually, okay, in no way it's, it, it's starting to become like America. You know, America, unfortunately, but they're young African, African-American, they get shot by police every day for doing nothing. I don't know if this is going to happen to Norway, but I've heard about situation where police come and arrest small boys at McDonald's. That is very sad, you know? Like, you, you cannot be a, a young boy with a hoodie because then the police would think that you're a criminal just because you are black. And I think there's, there's somebody who said, what did we do to become... Like, black, yeah, it was you. We didn't do anything. We were just born like this. God made us like this. But we should be proud of our skin and our color and our culture and our country. It's just unfortunately that we have to make, like, we have to work harder, you know? We, we have to. We will get checked up at the, at the airport, of course. How many people haven't been checked at the airport just because you're an African? They would, check, they would think that you, I don't know, you're doing drugs or you are a terrorist or I don't know what. Like, okay, we have to do that. But for, for your young boys, they, they have friends. Just know their friends. Just, just try to know them. 
you know, d just double check who their friends are. We can talk later, okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah, I will just uh, answer the question about the, the, that the man uh, posed about respect and disrespect in, in when it comes to FGM. It was a good point because I think that when the girl is cut, uh, in that moment she's without any power and she's just lying there. She loses self-respect because she's weak. And that is the reason why the healing process and togetherness uh, with others are so important. Because in that she's giving justifications and she's given respect and love uh, by the parents. But of course, moving to a, to a country like Norway, where it's not uh, the convention of doing FGM, so he, she won't get so much respect. She will lose respect. So talking about FGM, it will be difficult. But in Norway, it's not forbidden to be cut, but it is forbidden to cut a daughter uh, and send her back and, and do it on her. But uh, anyways, she's supposed to get uh, uh, good health uh, uh, services. But anyway, uh, I think that uh, the respect in some ways of being cut is lost, at least here. Uh, yeah, that is my reply. I don't have anything else to say. Thank you. Norsk? Angående spørsmålet om stigma, så kan ikke jeg si at jeg opplevde mye av det eller så har jeg bare vært ignorant. For det er egentlig mamma som må spørre om det der, for det er hun som har tatt vare på meg helt siden jeg har vært med på sykehusbesøk, skolebesøk. Så det er kanskje et spørsmål hun kan svare mer på. For jeg er de siste årene så har jeg egentlig bare tatt vare på meg selv. Og da har jeg på en måte hatt folk rundt meg som har vært veldig forståelsesfull. Leger og skolefolk som bare har tatt det med, ja, tatt det med greit, tatt det greit. Jeg stiller dem spørsmål og sånt. Det har fått noe vanskelige spørsmål. For å svare deg, hva heter du igjen? Naima. Du vet at hvis du har kommet til Norge som flyktning, eller du har fått opphold til alt i Norge, og du har både rett og plikt, som det heter, til å gå på norsk kurs, til å lære norsk. Det spiller ingen rolle om du er hjemmeværende kvinne, om du har kommet i dag. Ingen skal nekte deg å gå på norsk kurs. Det vet du. Eller? Hvis du kjenner kvinner som trenger norsk opplæring, og som ikke har fått det, så har de fortsatt denne retten. Det er jo noen begrensninger på antall år. Men si til dem at de må ta kontakt med om det er bidel, om det er i Oslo, de må ta kontakt med en bidel. Om det er en kommune, så må de ta kontakt med en kommune. De har rett til norsk opplæring, faktisk opp til 3000 timer. Så i Norge kan man egentlig nesten ikke klage på at man ikke har rett til å gå på norsk kurs. Det er bare arbeids, de som får oppholdtillatelse som arbeidstakere. Nei, det var ikke det nå. Arbeidsinnvandring, de må betale for norsk opplæring. Men hvis du har flyktning, eller du har familie gjennført med en flyktning, da har du rett til å rare norsk. Og så kan jeg si en ting til. Det strategien som jeg snakket om i dag, åpner for, hvis den blir godkjent da, åpner for at kvinner som har bodd i Norge lenge som ikke kan norsk kommer til å bli tvunget faktisk ikke bare vil men tvunget til å lære man faktisk det blir en plikt hvis man skal ta imot sosial hjelp skal man gå på norsk kurs og dette er den nye satsingen så den kommer så på en eller annen måte får man mulighet til å lære norsk og så og så How can you integrate those who live outside the cities? My sister there. I think it's actually much easier to integrate outside the cities than in the cities. That's my experience, and 
probably a lot of research shows that it's much easier uh, at least to, to learn Norwegian, to be able to speak Norwegian, it's much more easier uh, in the, not rural areas, but I mean outside the big cities and uh, small, smaller towns. But and, uh, again, that depends on your contacts with the local people. If you are isolated, obviously you are not going to be integrated. So um, there are, I could tell you, some, some, there are some local uh, NGOs and uh, who work with this um, uh, this kind of thing, like Red Cross, and, and, and just try to find out around the cities near you or in the city where you live, in the rural area you live in, try to find out those organizations and try to get contacts. Um, and my brother there, you asked about the new integration policy, and uh, don't you think it's too late? Uh, my answer is, it is never too late to, <laughs> to uh, create a situation where people get integrated. Even though there are fewer uh, refugees coming to Norway than, let's say, for two, two years ago or one year ago, still there are few, uh, and, and uh, Norway is actually obliged to, uh, to receive something like 5,000 uh, UN refugees each year. That means those 5,000 refugees need to be resettled and needs to be integrated. And for those, it's not too late. For some of us who existed here or some who lived longer, maybe. But I don't think it's even too late because the policies try to address both newcomers and also the effect should be also on those who have stayed longer. So I, I just want to put, and um, the, the next question is, about money, did you ask our organization? I did. Funding. funding, yeah. You know, the, the funding is, as, as you know, the funding, uh, the, the, uh, the integration funding, now we are going to change. Now it's going to change, starting from the 1st of uh, January. The funding system will change somehow. Um, um, and there will be only one big applicable funding uh, starting from January. Uh, and that one, all our organizations have the possibility to apply both to IMDI, the Integration Directorate, or to the communes. And there will be more rules around that. But I just want to ask you and to advise you for those who want to organize yourself. Please, there are the big opportunities, possibilities to organize yourself. But make yourself more relevant by being nagging. As, as Aki says, you have to come forward. You have to use the media, you have to use the politicians, get in touch with local politicians, try to use influences. Otherwise, if you sit and uh, wait for a positive response, you don't get it. Because there are many other well-organized, well-capable organizations who are also going after those monies. For you to be able to get a bigger slice of any public uh, money, you need to, first of all, you need to fulfill the criteria, read criteria very well. And there is my sister from Frivillet Norge, you, they would help you, they are one of the organizations who, who really uh, have a system how to organize yourself and how to build an organization and how to create a viable democratic organization. Those help you a lot in order to build yourself up. And, and, uh, and try to make it a bigger organization, a relevant organization, because uh, we are talking about people with African origin. We do, there are no organizations except POWA, which is, which is somehow a, a known organization. But there are no other organizations who really lift themselves up to be so relevant, like, like uh, Umudis, for example. You need to lift your... your um, you need to lift your both organization capacity and also engagement profile. Go to Sturtinga, you know, you, you just, you'll be surprised how quickly you could get a good response. Since he's on that topic of funding, I would also like to challenge him because there are a couple structural problems when it concerns funding. It's not just apply and we are fantastic. Even if you have a, a brilliant um, resume, you're not going to get money. And that the reason for that is because there are several things you have to look at. The person treating your or looking at your application, 
and you're the first time applying and has to make a, a choice between an old organization that they have a track record with and a new organization that they, know they don't know, and your name is Ali Akbar, they're going, they're going, with, they're going with Kari Nurman. And because there are certain things that, what should I say, conjures up in the brain uh, 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 with the particular person. That's one problem you have there. So it's a, it's a, a problem of, account not accountability, but confidence in the new organization. And you must also remember, every time that they catch an African or foreign organization that is blown up in all the newspapers, right? For stealing 20 crowns, we have made frontline page and headline news on all the newspapers. And then that Saks Pahandla looks at it again and says, wow, and, and they're asking for 100,000 crowns. You know something, we'll wait and see what they do. So they put that on the side. Another, what I want to challenge uh, to Sven Ehez, I am saying that Norwegian organizations who apply for funding to work on behalf of foreigners must have in the in the, um, the draft, no, in the draft of the project, they must have minority involvement. If they are working constantly with immigrant populations, they must have representation on their boards. Gone is the time when an all-white board, Norwegian organization, is going to be working and representing Africans, Asians, and others. So there must be inclusion in the organizational life. And the third thing that is very important is that there's a lack of, what should I say, the professionalization of the African organizations have to be enhanced and the competency improved. You will see that when they write applications. We in Omud, we have written applications for 25 years and we still can't write an application good enough. <laughs> so far less for people who are now coming to, the, to, to, to that particular ball game and getting involved. And the other thing is, forget about the um, bureaucrats. They don't decide. You have to speak to the politicians. You will hear the, you will hear the politicians tell you, no, 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 um, that's the FAG organ. Uh, they are FAG director. And then when I started to test the system, I'll give you a joke. One day I went to a particular start secretary. And when, I'd, when we sent an application, there was no money. But we asked for a meeting because we had got an afschlag. We asked, well, asked for a meeting, went to, the, to meet the start secretary, made a little presentation, and he said, I'll never forget it. He said, but you know something, I like the work that you all do. And then he just called somebody in the corridor and the lady came in and he said, can you get a time stuff so you get into the same thing? We got 250,000 crowns in 10 minutes. I hadn't got that in five years. And that was when I sent my applications to the bureaucrat. <laughs> so you have to learn the system, but I just want to jump over. That was that. I want to say something, the narrative. You asked where are the positive aspects of the African culture or African community. Yeah, but we don't write any newspapers. We started a Pan-African magazine in 1984. It went bankrupt in one year. You know why? Because they didn't go out and sell it. So they printed the magazine and they left it on the shelf. So that was the end of that. That could have been, that could have been a very powerful medium today. Pan-African, okay. So, who defines the narrative of the African in this country? The Norwegian society, and they don't know you. So, that means that their narrative is a ghost. It is not really you. So, this is number one problem, the narrative. Uh, number two, uh, there was a discussion about um, employment. I'll get back to your point, John. I'm coming there. The question about employment. Yes, there are problems with employment, and there are many reasons for that. But do like the Asians, create your own jobs. What you're waiting on, you're already selling out China, China already buying out Africa. I want to say that. Africa, China is buying you out. <laughs> All right. Um, so create your own employment. This thing where you're going out knocking on people's doors all the time and they just refuse you. Then, okay, that doesn't work. Find another method. And the method is create your own employment. Right now, there are many um, financial schemes for, for entrepreneurs in Norway, right? Ni teng ting, ni in washun. Start thinking about these things and getting access. If you can't do it, find somebody who could do it. Lock on like a magnet onto a, a flagship and sail along with it. But you have to get access. Access is the problem that the African community has. We don't have access. 
neither. In 25 years, I've gone to so many different meetings at the ministries, at parliament. I see Asians. I see from, I don't see any Africans. Where is the African community in the power structure in this country? None. We've had, we've had a Pakistani, an Indian in parliament, no African. Well, we had one African, sorry. But she was cancelled after a very short space of time. And she wasn't voted in. She was just a minister. She was chosen as a minister. But the point is, where is the African community in the power structure in this country? They're not there. One asked about African claiming rights. You can't claim rights if you're not organized. You have to be organized. And the African community is lacking organizational skills. You come to a meeting with the African community, they, they reach late. And then some big chief comes who reaches late and then asks for the meeting to, to start. So he reaches half an hour late. He didn't hear the first half an hour, but he demands that the meeting is now started for his own convenience. That is not democracy, and that is very impolite. So organizational skills we lack. Organizational understanding we lack. My, the way how I perceive the African community when it concerns organizational work, it's like you're going to an organization as a psychologist. You come there to complain and make noise and speak about the same problems over and over, and you leave without making a decision as to what you want to accomplish, who has been delegated responsibilities to make sure that these assignments are done, and the next time we have a meeting, we're back to square one. No forward movement whatsoever. That's, we need to look and address those issues. They are not, it's not the Norwegian society creating those problems. It is a lack of understanding for what organizational work is all about. So we, ha we need to learn that. Um, funding, and then there was the last point of, so by the way, so if we have organizations, we go to parliament, we lobby, we put our agenda on the political um, platform, then we can start talking. But all the African community does is complain, make noise, have little meetings, but there is no strategy as to how we're going to achieve what aims or what we see. Last point, somebody spoke about um, racial profiling, the kids being profiled. Um, kids growing up in this country, there's a duality. They're going to have to deal with that. I was born in England in 1959. My mother Norwegian, my father Trinidadian, growing up in a white society. Even when we left and came to the Caribbean, where you have a variety of different people, you will always have the issue of identity and attachment. That is something we all have to deal with. It's to teach your children the skills that is necessary. Make them aware and conscious about these things. When it concerns our black young youth on the street, especially male, and, but today it's also female. My daughter is only 15. She was 15 in September. She has been controlled at least four times by the police since she was 13 until she's 15. Just imagine that, with all her other friends, they're all girls. They have been controlled. The McDonald's situation, our kids are being racially profiled. And we have spoken about racial profiling in Norway for 25 years. And I have not once heard or got an African organization to come along with us to Stutinga and say, our children are being racially profiled. We have sent around letters that the African organizations have signed, Nigerians, Gambians, and others concerning racial profiling. But we need to be more vocal. We need to be more, what should I say, on the ball. When something happens and people call, we don't have to have these violent demonstrations. That's not what we're talking about. But when you see that, what, I don't care where the child is from. Once it's a black youth, and we see the child has been, the child is complaining, we need as parents, we need as the African, Pan-African community, to go to the authorities and say, hey, we're not looking at this one particular case, but you know something? Our kids have a problem with the police in this country. Can you tell us why? No, let me just f summarize here. The police are not mandated to register their controls. You would believe that they register these things. They are not. They have what you call all the different types of control. Narcotica control, Utlenings control, um, criminal for a beginner control. Why are you doing Ogua. For a beginner arbeid. So ungdom will put a end dog so hard he blit mutter fem for shelly of dealing for politia. All of it's not coming them. But they will not come politia. Or deeply track us yet. For the ekesant at the end to gang so see ungdom vetava fifania snakrikemedai. Or da had a problem. 
Og da sier politimannen, men du er frekk. Ja, og så begynner den der problematikk, konflikt mellom politi og ditt barn. Og ditt barn taper. Uansett om han er rett eller gal, eller gjort noe galt. Det er politiet mot deg. Så, makt. Så det som er, jeg ber, jeg kommer til å sende et brev til Pawa, og jeg kommer til å be Pawa, sammen med flere andre afrikanske organisasjoner, vi drar til Stortinget og setter dagsorden. I stedet for å få den beskjeden at noen tegner hvem afrikanere er, og sender det til dere og sier bli med. Og det er rart, fordi du vil se Røde Kors og mange andre etnisk norske organisasjoner, de vil ha to-tre afrikanere, det passer fint, ser bra ut i bildet. Men jeg utfordrer dere i dag, Se hvor afrikanere er i det norske systemet. Hvis du drar til Storo, Oslo City, Akebrygge, har dere sett en svart mann eller kvinne som står i frontlinjetjeneste der? Bare tenk på det. Har dere noen gang sett en svart mann eller kvinne som selger på vinmonopol? Hva slags utdanning må du ha for å få den jobb? Når sist så du en svart mann eller kvinne var på Evita eller et kaffe? og solgte kaffe. I utelivsbransjen nå er det østeuropeisk hvit arbeidskraft som har overtatt. Ja, vi er på tiltaksplass. Tiltaksplass. Der har vi massevis. Så, jeg avslutter ved å si dere vet hva problemene er. Begynn å gjøre noe som John påpeker. Det er på tide at vi snakker om hva vi skal gjøre. Så dere kommer til å få power, kommer til å få et brev fra oss. Vi skal til Stortinget, takk. Jeg bare vil si noe. Ja, de unge mennene her. For jeg ser noen unge mennene her. Det er ikke unge mennene, unnfortunnet. Unge mennene, inkludert deg. Det er veldig viktig at du tar the responsibility from your parents and be because you know the society to be organized is a key as um, Aki said without organization without doing an, uh, things in an organized way you will not go forward so my advice to you is to be organized to complain it doesn't help you just need to organize yourself Organize yourself. There are a lot of uh, support systems for those who are organized. Those support systems, you need to find them out. It's not that difficult. You, you can even contact me if you want to. I could advise you, and, and I say free let Norge. And there are, there are many ways of getting help to get organized. And when I say organization, just not names. Just organize yourself in a very good way so that you will be able to have a voice in the society. That's what I want to say. Um, thank you very much to the panelists. I think they've all said well of what we can take out of everything that has been said here today is the ability to be able to organize ourselves. You know, that's the challenge. You know, because I had what Dr. John Kisuilu said about no, it's not all about negativities. No, we have a lot of positive things going for us in the society. That is very true. You know, but sir, the question is, I mean, like I said, are we in the right places? You know, where decisions are taken. And if you are not there, unfortunately, I mean, you will always miss out. So please, let's be organized. Thank you very much. I mean, I know everybody has got their flowers. So... Uh, we, uh, the program is drawing to a close, um, but before we do that, and before I call on Auntie Christina, um, I, would like, I would like to call on, um, we, have, we have a distinguished guest amongst us. Um, she is the Assistant General Secretary of Free Willy Norge. Um, this is a lady, I mean, that has always been helpful any time of the day. Any time of the day, if you call on her, if you have any problem, if you ask her, she'll be able to give you a good answer. So please, 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 ladies and gentlemen, I would like to give, uh, I would like to give the microphone to Ida Holman to just give us one or two words. Thank you.
Thank, thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, so I will keep you just for two seconds. Uh, um, my name is Ida. I am working in an organization called the Association of NGOs in Norway. Uh, in Norwegian, the name is Frivillighet Norge. Pava is one of our members and it is always very nice to be in, at this conference. I always learn a lot and also I have learned a lot today from the speakers and from the participants. There has been a lot of talking about uh, uh, how to organize and I want to tell you that in Frivilliet Norge we give courses on how to run an organization. So if you would like to learn more about that, uh, take a look at our website, here are some cards uh, and if you don't remember, uh, if there is not enough cards, ask Bente, she will know how to find me and I hope that you will uh, keep in touch. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, our visit card is just here. If you if you need one, please pick one. And like she rightly said, if you don't know how to get in touch, if you ask um, Sister Bente or if you ask Sister Christina or, or, or Mommy Regina, I mean, they will be able to tell you what to do. Please, ladies and gentlemen, um, I would like to call on the president and co-founder of Power and co-founder of the CCD Norway in the person of Auntie Christina Mungai. Please come and give us your closing remarks. Please, please, let's give her a warm round of applause. Uh, <clears throat> I'm sorry that uh, a lot of people have left for the whatever we had left. Uh, but uh, of course, I have some few remarks that I'm going to read a little bit uh, in connection with the, our main speakers. There are some points that were very, very important that cannot go unnoticed. And uh, let me start with, the, first of all, our crew, the photographers and the video taking. We've been with them uh, very early in the morning, and they have been with us with this remarkable work they have done. Thank you very much, as I do, and our beautiful daughters. We have to, because without them, I don't think we could have made this seminar to be the way it is. Second to that, uh, Benta, uh, she introduced power, but what I, I should tell Benta, because she was talking very, very positive about power, what we have done, well, if you place a cook, Maybe next time the cook will make food go bad. Maybe it will be burned or whatever. So thank you, Benta, for uh, acknowledging us. And of course, the members that we have been having in power and all that. Thank you, Benta, for that. The first speaker that has just left, he touched some of the important facts. Uh, and what Im, uh, Im, impressed me very, very much was that uh, he was focusing mostly on the challenges go about. And six of them, I don't need to, to repeat them, but uh, it was very, very good to follow these uh, policies and see how it is. Because when you come to Norway, you are new, you don't know anything, and then it is offering this um, education to learn the language because that is the most difficult thing, it's a barrier to integration and uh, as they are offering the courses there was something I wanted to challenge him but I didn't want to ask because they are divided into two groups there is a group that doesn't get uh, this uh, free education and then you wonder how are they going to make it if they don't have enough income but anyway he's, he's gone that challenge will come maybe sometimes. And then he talked about employment. And he talked uh, something that impressed me much also was that uh, the time that he spent at the motor. We see so many families that have been living in a motor for so many years. Maybe a mother comes with children and being to put together in a motor with 
grown-ups and all that. So that is a very big challenge that we have observed. And uh, so this about the uh, labor market and all that was very, very much uh, impressive to hear about. Uh, coming to our sister uh, Churchill, uh, he spoke about uh, sickle cell. Believe me, if you have a, a sickness that is, and especially youth, they tackle the situation very in a different way than us grown-ups. Not only sickle cell, but also diabetes among youth. Most of them cannot express themselves because of stigmatizing, uh, be, being stigmatized. And this young man stood here, talked about uh, sickle cell, because sickle cell is, it, uh, if, I, if I may say, when Benta told me about it, I didn't know about it, and I went through so many books to see how it is. So it's a disease that is not very well known here. But the way he tackled, but what impressed me is that uh, you get uh, support, maybe you are supported financially to, to eat uh, healthy fo uh, food and to maybe... That, those are the things that uh, I really appreciated because that these uh, people who have this kind of sickness should live like any other person and feel that they are not uh, separated from other people. So I was so impressed to see a young man coming to talk about uh, the, ch I mean, the challenges he's facing and all that and all that. Uh, we come to our sister, Ingelisa, who has been our mentor for all many years. She has been our role model and she has penetrated to Africa, darkest uh, place like Gambia. And when she was in Gambia, I saw her sometimes. She was just like a Gambian. It's only that she didn't have a tie her head off and she could look like any person in, in Gambia. And that's very impressive because she learned a lot when she visit the villages. Because I've noticed that most of the people when they go to, okay, in Kenya, where I come from, they just meet the people in the city. You don't know what is happening in the villages and that is where they are practicing this, uh, uh, this uh, FGM. So it was, it's so nice that you, are, you can tolerate to come to Africa and go to the deeper side so that you can discover where the, <coughs> the, the problem is. And the statistics that she gave us, I was so impressed coming from Kenya some years back. The rate of uh, FGM in Kenya was very high. But I was so impressed to see that it, it has gone down very, very fast. And uh, Benta herself, she has uh, an organization there she, who is a coordinator at the darkest side of Kenya, at the western side. So it shows that Benta, you have also played a very, very big uh, prize uh, for that. And uh, if I could say you could uh, get a Nobel Prize on FGM, but uh, I'm not the one to decide, but you deserve one because you have done very, very well. Okay, let's come to the other speaker was uh, Janet. And uh, sorry, before I, I leave, because uh, Inge Lisa said that people don't want to listen. They are told something, but they don't want to hear about this. And FGM has been there going on on a daily basis. These people are just practicing it, whether it's there, but they say they listen and then tomorrow they just continue. So they have to be pushed very, very hard. And uh, what impressed me is Egypt, that they are using this uh, medication, uh, not doing like the practical, I uh, mean this uh, traditional they were doing before. Uh, they are using, a, although it is a FGM, but uh, they are using a better method than before. That they are using this uh, medicine and then maybe one get painkiller. I may say that uh, you are their ambassadors. You work together, Nene has left, Power and other organizations, you are their ambassadors. When you travel back home, I know there are challenges there, but try to talk to those people to see whether we can stop with this uh, tradition, harming tradition. And these people who are dealing with it, because some of them they are doing it for, because of economical problems, so this uh, factory should be 
close down and the keys be drawn to the sea where no one will ever see. That's the only way we can eliminate this uh, FGM. Uh, Janet, I don't know where she is, she was the last speaker. Uh, she said that uh, when she was looking about this, uh, asking about uh, integration and uh, racism, well, when I came to Norway, maybe I could feel, because if you live in a small villages, there's too much racism there. But in Oslo here, it's not as open as small villages. Because when we came to Norway, we were settled at a place called uh, Hallingdal. All, there were no Africans there. And we had also many people from Asia who was, we are being traumatized because people had never seen many foreigners and all that and all that. But when we moved to Bergen, it was a bit also, but coming to Oslo was far much better. So about uh, racism, I've said so many times that uh, the Norwegian society is a bit uh, reserved. But if you want to go ahead, if I experienced racism before, it's not, it was before I started working. So you have to knock the door, you have to go where they are, look for them, don't lock the door. It is difficult to be accepted, but when the Norwegian people accept you, they are just like Maasai, they stick to you. So if you want to be integrated, work with them, talk with them, chew tobacco with them if they are chewing, and be integrated to them and everything becomes well. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Auntie Christina. Um, that was a very, very good um, summary of everything I mean that has been said today. Uh, now we have the last speaker for the day. This is somebody and I call mom um, in this society. She's a co-founder of our Power Association and Power Foundation, Norway. She's a very, very, very strong advocate of the rights of girls and women. Um, she's one of the most respected um, people in the African community, especially, especially in the Nigerian community, where I come from. Um, she has been very supportive to quite a lot of people. And she has also been president of Power for several years before giving over the mantle to Auntie Benta. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, it is with great honor I mean that I introduce Mommy Regina Dada to come and give us the vote of thanks for the day. Thank you very much. It's so sad that many, most of the people have gone for today. They just came and they left. But I have to give my words of thanks anyway, because at least those that are here are appreciated. They are good people. <laughs> thank you. First and foremost, I have to thank, at least uh, Tesema is not here. The speakers, they, were, they did a very good job. But I have to say very good words to our mentor. She's not only our mentor, Mem Ingelise Lien, who spoke about the NGFGM. In 2010, the first funding that Power had was provided by her through her organization. For that, she has been working strongly with Power throughout, and we give a good <laughs> credit to that. Thank you. And I have to say, Aki, thank you very much for coming. In spite of the fact that we had a problem of getting you, at least you were able to come to the panel. Thank you very much. And Hi, people. So, <laughs> so what I have to say is thank you for coming. The African community that were here, both men and women, it was good to have you. And as you came to the power of God, I pray that God will lead you back to your different destination. In Jesus' name I pray. And I have to say thank you very much for the two whites that are still here. I pray from Ingelise. Ida, thank you very much for coming. And you, my sister, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> and the children, thank you very much for coming. <laughs> it, was really nice. it was really nice having you all here. So thank you. My son. <laughs> my son, the moderator. 
he <laughs> he got us through all the the programs for today from 10 o'clock till now it was very it was very good I, I really appreciated your effort and thank you for your good words and for all the things that came from you and you were so strong at least to come out with what you really feel it was good to have here and on the audience thank you and thank you for power power is both power pan african administration and power power foundation this is the newly established fire organization in power so we are working hand in hand thank you very much my people <laughs> that came <laughs> and thank you for my family my friends my co-workers my sisters and brothers goodbye well travel <laughs> thank you <laughs> Um, thank you very much, Mommy. I mean, um, I don't think there's much to say. Thank you, every, everybody, for coming. Um, safe journey home. And um, thank you, Saiduba, uh, our cameraman for the day. Thank you, <laughs> Kamzi. Uh, thank you, my sister there. Thank you.